thank you, Brian. Um, um, and I apologize, I was late. My uh, wife and I have a newborn, and I'm learning very quickly. If you don't tack about two hours onto however much time you think you need, then you're not going to have enough time. Um, but um, so I'm going to talk tonight about cod. So talking less about water and more about one of the things that lives in it. Um, and I've, I've titled this talk A New Dawn for Cod, it's trying to put a positive spin on a situation that's um, good cause for a lot of pessimism right now, but um, as I hope I'll convince you through this talk that while the cod resource and the cod fishery are experiencing a lot of pain right now, I, th I think there are some reasons to think we, we may be able to turn a corner, we may be able to take one last gasp and, and save this fish um, and this fishery. So this is the star of our show, this is the Atlantic cod, Gattis Morkua. Um, I thought you were here already. <laughs> um, I don't know why that's, there we go. Okay. Here we go. I don't know why that keeps coming up. All right. Um, so this is our fish, uh, the codfish. Um, I, I said this is an iconic fishery because if you look around this region, you see evidence of cod in our culture and our economy all over the place. So that was pretty true. Um, up in the, let's see, upper left-hand corner is a, is a wooden codfish that hangs in the Massachusetts State House. In fact, I think it's illegal um, in the state of Massachusetts to write a newspaper article about the cod fishery and not mention that this <laughs> fish is hanging in the State House. Um, if you go to enough talks about cod, you will inevitably see this photo in the lower right-hand corner of this, oh, sorry, lower left, this old-timey kid standing next to two cod that just dwarf him, showing kind of what these fish used to look like, how big they used to be. Um, of course, this big curly spit of sand that sticks out off the southeastern part of Massachusetts is named after this fish. Um, but perhaps more importantly, that this resource has provided food and jobs for a lot of people for a long time. It still does to this day, although not what it once was. Um, all of this actually led Mark Herlansky, a, an author who's written several really interesting books, um, one titled simply Cod, to dub this the fish that changed the world. Um, okay, so th this, and this is a really great book. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Um, I think this book really launched a, almost a new subgenre of um, books that sort of weave together natural history, natural resources with history more broadly. Um, there's been several that have followed. I don't know if any are this good, um, although I'm probably biased because I have a real affinity for the subject. Um, but, so this is an important fish. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the fish itself um, and, and its populations in our part of the world and talk a little bit about the state we're in now with this resource and the fishery. Um, but then, like I said, with a few indications that we may be in a position to turn the corner. Um, it's gonna be a long shot, but, but I think some things are falling nicely into place. Um, but as I said from the outset, if you've been reading the papers over the last year, you probably have the impression that the cod fishery is not doing well, and that's pretty accurate. You can't always believe what you read in the papers, but this time you actually can. Um, so there's been a lot of headlines about severe cuts in quotas and the economic <coughs> strain this is, this is putting on fishermen. Um, so, so who is this fish? So this map here, um, I don't know how well you can see that, but the blue area shows the range of the Atlantic cod, and it, and it covers a pretty broad area of the North Atlantic, uh, heading up around Greenland, across the North Atlantic, around Iceland, and right up through Northern Europe, Scandinavia, and Russia. Now, we're right here, um, the Gulf of Maine, so we're actually at the far edge of range of this fish. Um, the, the center of its range is much further north and much further to the east. Now, often when you have a population at its edge of range, it can be a very marginal population. It can be one that kind of comes and goes with the vagaries of nature. It can be one that um, often isn't as large or productive. It's a, it's a, it can be a fringe population. Interestingly, that's not quite the case here, but I'll, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, what we're dealing with, though, here in the Gulf of Maine, is a fair, and actually with, with cod in general, is a fairly young population, geologically and evolutionarily speaking. So back in the Permian, about 250 million years ago, the Atlantic Ocean didn't even exist. It was, um, what was going to become the Atlantic Ocean 
was, was really just a fault between several plates that formed up um, the supercontinent Pangaea. Fast forwarding several tens of hundreds of millions of years to the Pleistocene, the Atlantic Ocean has now formed, those, those continental plates have drifted apart to create this large ocean, but in our part of the world, the Gulf of Maine still doesn't really exist, or at least what will become the Gulf of Maine is sitting under these polar ice sheets. So while the Atlantic has now formed, the evolution of cod has begun, in our part of the world, they still, they still aren't really there. Um, by the time we get to the present, though, the ice sheets have receded, the Atlantic is fully formed, um, the Gulf of Maine is no longer ice, but it's now wet, and, um, and, and cod can begin to colonize and, and start, to, um, start to establish populations. But, but all this means is that this, the Atlantic in general, relative to the Pacific, and particularly our corner of the Atlantic, is a very young system, um, again, geologically speaking. Now what that means is we actually have fairly low biodiversity in the Gulf of Maine relative to other parts of the world. So this is a graph I borrowed from a paper by John Whitman at Brown University. And what John and his co-authors did was they went and sampled a whole um, range of large marine ecosystems across the world. And what they tracked was as they sampled more and more and more, how many new species did they detect in that system? So in some, of these, in some of these systems, you'll see that the more they sampled, the more species they kept finding. Um, those curves that just keep going up and up and up. Some, however, are pretty flat. It didn't take long to detect all the species in the system, and in some cases, it wasn't many at all. So where were we? Species area curves. OK, so um, like I said, this, these lines each represent a series of different marine ecosystems around the world. Um, you might be able to read them up in the corner, but they span um, tropical to arctic waters. Um, and, and again, what they're showing is how many species were detected, the harder and harder you looked. Um, here's the Gulf of Maine. It's doing this automatically. Um, um, Again, okay. it's the age of timing. So here's the Gulf of Maine, a, a fairly low diversity system, which, which is due to its youthfulness, due to the fact that the Atlantic Ocean is a relatively young ocean, and this is a relatively young corner of the Atlantic. Um, despite that, however, the Gulf of Maine has been a fairly productive system, especially with respect to its cod population. This is a more detailed map of the geography and topography of the Gulf of Maine. And, and what I hope you can see is the area actually has a very complex seafloor. Um, it's, it's made up of all sorts of banks and ledges and, and basins. So there's a lot of topography there and a lot of habitat diversity. Um, and, and the seafloor itself is a mixture of, in some places, just mud and sand. In other places, really complex boulders and cobbles. There's deep water corals. There's sea grasses in the near shore. So, it's actually a very productive system despite its youth and despite its fairly low diversity. Um, adding to that is the fact that there's, there's a whole series of large rivers, um, mostly along the coast of Maine, that drain into the Gulf of Maine. And, and they, create, um, they create a really important ecological connection and, and add a lot of productivity to the area. Um, in particular, um, let's see, this is the cutest dog. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> So this is my dog up in Maine um, harassing alewives, which is a type of sea run herring. And it's one of maybe a dozen or 15 different species of sea run fishes. So things like salmon that live at sea but run up rivers to spawn. Um, this part of the world hosts a pretty high diversity um, of, these, of these fishes. Um, and what they do is they really bring a lot of upstream inland productivity out into the ocean and back and forth. So it really enhances the productivity of the Gulf of Maine. Which has, helped, um, which has helped create some of the really productive fisheries we have. Um, don't try to read this whole thing, but I really found this interesting. This was a, um, a, a petition I found online in the Maine State Archives from the citizens of Goldsboro um, in Hancock County, Maine, to their state legislature in 1824. And they were petitioning for the state to do something about, a, um, about an old mill dam that was inhibiting the passage of the sea run herring. And the main reason they gave for that was because it was well known, they said, that cod follow these herring inshore um, to feed on them and create these coastal spawning populations that were accessible to their fishermen. So back as far as the 1800s, this, this linkage between these river systems and, and the sea 
were well understood and, and already were a source of concern. Um, now, cod have actually been a part of our diet and a part of our economies um, for not just hundreds but thousands of years. Um, So this is a slide I borrowed from Bob Stenick, who is a researcher up at, the, um, up at the University of Maine. And Bob and some of his colleagues have been sifting around in old Native American middens in the area. And what they found, um, what they found are fish hooks that they've been able to date back as old as 500 years, and vertebrae from codfish that they've been able to date back as far as 4,000 years. So this system has been really pr producing um, productive fisheries for a long time that have been feeding human populations. In fact, when Bob and his colleagues started counting everything they found in these middens, so this is a whole range of different types of sea creatures, including fish, I think even seals are in here somewhere, um, some invertebrates, vertebrates, counting up the parts of these different species they found these, in these middens, the number one species um, was Atlantic cod. So going back four or 5,000 years ago, uh, this isn't a new phenomenon that this fish has been important culturally, economically, for subsistence. Um, this is something that's been going on for a long time. Um, so, so that's kind of where this fish has come from and where it was for a long time. Unfortunately, this is where it is now. Um, these two graphs were taken from the most recent stock assessment for Atlantic cod. For, for those who... Um, aren't as up on their fishery jargon as nerds like I am. Stock assessment is basically a big, massive analysis of a fish population. So we collect just about every piece of data we can, um, find on the, on the population, run it through some incredibly complex models, and we're really only trying to understand a handful of things. One, how many fish do we think are out there? Um, two, how many do we think there should be if this population was healthy? And three, well, I guess three would be how hard should we be fishing them in order to maintain the maximum um, productivity we can? And then four, how hard, how hard are we actually fishing them? So in other words, how many fish should there be in a healthy population, and how hard do you fish to, to get that? And then what is the reality compared to those targets? Does that make sense? So what this is showing is the top graphs is the um, abundance of cod going back only to about the early 1980s. So in the grand scheme of things, not a terribly long time series. You can see there's certainly been some variation through time, but by and large, the population has come more pretty continually downhill. Actually, the low point was back in the 1990s, and we've had a little bit of a recovery since then, although it's kind of ebbed and flowed. So we haven't seen the resource do what we want it to do, which is to get back um, to abundance, not just in the 1980s, but well, well beyond that. Um, the last year of this assessment, it was estimated that there were 10, about 10,000 metric tons of cod in the water. The target for a population that would produce the maximum yield is 61,000 metric tons. So we're at less than 20% of really where we should be for this resource to be healthy and to be producing the sorts of economic and ecological benefits that we'd like. The major, oops, uh, the major reason for that um, this bottom graph shows the fishing mortality rate, so how hard are we fishing this population? And again, you can see it's, it's gone up and down a bit. Um, it's actually been a little more stable in recent years. It, it certainly hasn't been as high as it was um, back in the 90s when the population really bottomed out. But at the end of this assessment, it was estimated that we were fishing at a rate of about, I believe, 0.8. Don't worry about what that means. Um, just worry about where that is relative to the target. The target is 0.2, so that's the, the rate of mortality um, we should be imposing on this population to maximize its productivity, and instead we're imposing a target of 0.8, so four times as much. So overfishing is a key reason that cod are in the state they're in. Um, but it's not the only reason. You know, we have actually pulled mortality back quite a bit, even though we're not where we want to be, and we're still not seeing as strong a response as we'd like. Um, one of the reasons for that is, you remember those, that, that, that herring I showed a few slides ago that my dog was harassing? Um, that top picture, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's actually a run of these fish. It's in the Damariscotta River up in Maine. Uh, pretty impressive sight. If you get a, ever get a chance to see a herring run, I highly recommend it. You don't have to go all the way up to Maine. There's a few places in Massachusetts and Connecticut, um, even Rhode Island, that you can see herring run. Although 
the run in the Damariscotta River is one of the most impressive ones. Um, so every spring these fish come in in, in big droves, head upstream to spawn. Um, and again, there's, there's still some places where you can see some really impressive runs of herring, um, but not what it once was. So this bottom graph shows the um, annual commercial harvest of these herring along the entire coast, so, so from the Carolinas right up to Maine. Um, now, when you look at fishery catch data, it's, it's an index of, of the abundance of the population, but catch can be affected by many other factors. You know, if you close a fishery, um, catch is going to go to zero, even though the population may not go to zero. Market forces can have a factor. So there's, there's a lot of things that shape catch, but nevertheless, there is still some relationship between um, catch and the abundance of fish. And what you can see is back in the, about the mid-60s, coastwide, the catch of these fish was massive. We were talking on the order of 60 million pounds or more. Um, and through time, that has just plummeted to recent years. Um, we're really only looking at less than a million pounds, and, and actually in recent years, much less than a million pounds along the entire coast. Um, so there has been a severe depletion of this really important prey species for cod uh, across its range um, in our part of the world. Um, in fact, the depletion of these fish has been so severe that, that recently they were petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, now, cod are a pretty broad-based predator. They don't just eat river herring. Uh, they will eat sea herring, and they will eat sand lance, and they'll eat juveniles of much larger fish. They, they, they have a pretty broad diet. Um, but in the coastal zone, where some of the more important fisheries have historically existed, these river herring were an incredibly important food source, um, and really the thing that drew them right into those, those near shore waters. Um, and in too many places, they've been um, really severely depleted, and that's hurt cod. Um, on top of that, like many species, cod are suffering effects of climate change. Um, this, these graphs I've taken from a paper done by uh, Dr. Mike Fogarty, who works for the uh, National Marine Fishery Service Science Center down in Woods Hole. Um, up in the top graph there is showing the landings of cod um, on George's Bank and the Gulf of Maine going back to about the 1930s, so a fairly long time series. And you can see there's been some cycle through time, although you see what I showed in that earlier graph toward the end is from about the 80s onward, this pretty steady decline. The bottom graph shows the sea surface temperatures um, over that same time period. And what Mike noticed was that they actually are um, opposite one another. So early on when cod catches were high, sea surface temperatures were, were fairly low. As temperatures started to rise, cod catch came down Temperatures dropped again, cod catch came up. Um, and it's actually not surprising. This is a cold water species. Again, we're at the very edge of the range of a fish that goes well into Arctic waters. So these fish don't like warming wa warm waters. Well, unfortunately, waters are warming. And what Mike and his colleagues also did was take some of what we know about the effects of increasing temperatures on the growth and reproduction of cod and plug them into some of these fishery models. So what they estimated was for a range of different um, levels of fishing mortality, fishing pressure, how much yield, how much catch did, could we expect to get out of the population? So the top graph shows the current conditions, the, the sort of recent average temperatures, and, and it suggests that we could get about 10,000 metric tons of cod. Um, but what he found that was for even a one degree increase in average temperature, that catch would drop by about 20%. And for a two degree increase, it would drop about by another 20%. So we could, and these are, these are plausible scenarios of increases in sea surface temperatures. So we could, in the not too distant future, we may be there already, be looking at a resource that's far less productive um, than it once was, which might explain why we're not seeing the population respond as our models predict, because our models are not factoring in these temperature effects yet. Um, so cod may already be suffering effects of climate change, and if they're not, they may be very soon. Now, another, um, another problem that's faced this population, you know, everything I've talked about so far is how many cod are out there. Uh, I've talked a little bit about where they are, but where they are matters quite a bit. Um, a lot of species evolve a population structure that is widely spread out across the, the area of habitat that they can utilize. 
And that's basically a bet hedging strategy. The more different places you have populations, the more you're kind of buffered against some catastrophic event happening in one area. Um, unfortunately, what's happened through COD, I'm actually going to play a little movie that will illustrate this, is that through time, a population that used to be more widespread across the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank has actually really started to contract into a few small pockets. Um, so let me see if I can run this. Well, what this, 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 what this would show is, um, so this, the colors on this map show the distribution of cod. Hotter colors are um, higher abundance, and blue is basically no fish. Um, and what you can see is on George's Bank, so the, the sort of big thumb that sticks out um, almost straight off from Cape Cod, they were pretty well distributed across Georgia's bank. In the Gulf of Maine, the area where we are in the western Gulf of Maine has always been the area of highest abundance, but fish were much more widely spread out. If this movie worked, what you'd see through time is that those red areas really concentrate more and more and more into the western Gulf of Maine. So it's actually right off our, our doorstep here um, that most of the cod in the Gulf of Maine are remaining. And, and actually, this has caused a lot of problems because fishermen in places like Gloucester and Boston and Situate, when they head out to fish, they see reasonable numbers of cod in most years. So when scientists and fishery managers tell them that the abundance is low, they say, well, what are you talking about? The reason is because when we assess the resource, we look across the entire Gulf of Maine, and now most of the Gulf of Maine is, is virtually devoid of cod. They're all concentrated in this one little pocket, and I'm going to try to explain why in a moment. Um, but it causes some real conflicts between scientists, managers, and fishermen, but it also means, as I said, we really have all our eggs in one basket. We don't have a widely distributed population anymore. We've got them all in one little area, and if something happens to that one remaining little pocket, um, we could lose cod ecologically and economically speaking anyway um, for a long time. Um, when we try to understand what happens with these fish, it's important not just to look at these adults. Um, we, we tend to think about these big cod, like the ones in the, in the um, slide I showed earlier. We need to also think about the juveniles, and the juveniles um, have a much stronger dependence on seafloor habitats. And I think this is something John's going to talk about a bit more, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But even before the juvenile stage, we also have to think about these fish when they're little larvae. Um, like most fish, cod, which um, live on the seafloor as juveniles and adults, start their lives off as microscopic larvae floating up in the plankton. Um, there they are highly subject to oceanographic factors, and this map to the right um, shows the dominant current patterns in the Gulf of Maine. So those arrows show the direction and speed of a current. In other words, a larger arrow is faster, um, and, and its direction shows which way it's pointing. And what you can see is that the dominant current is what we call the main coastal current. It comes from up around Nova Scotia, down around the Gulf of Maine, uh, the coast of Maine, and then sort of curls around Cape Cod, branching off to Georges Bank and then around to southern New England. But when you hit this area in the western Gulf of Maine, the currents really slow down quite a bit, which means it's actually a good spot, um, or a likely spot anyway, for these little larvae to end up. So when they're out there in the plankton, they are really at the whims of these ocean currents in terms of where they are dispersed to. And many of them are going to be pushed right down into that pocket right off our doorstep and then kind of stay there, settle onto the bottom and grow up. So oceanography is part of what's, um, is part of what's causing this area in the western Gulf of Maine to be the center of abundance. Now that's being sort of exacerbated in recent years by other oceanographic changes. Um, this map over on the left shows chlorophyll patterns, so that's sort of an indicator of phytoplankton, um, microscopic plants um, that, that drift, in the, drift in the water. Um, and again, the hotter colors are a higher abundance, colder colors are lower abundance. And what you can see is that in recent years, there's been a real concentration of phytoplankton in the coastal areas, and particular, particularly in the western Gulf of Maine. As phytoplankton is important food for zooplankton. So zooplankton are animals, microscopic animals that drift around with ocean currents, um, like these little copepods in the photo to your left. Um, now these little copepods are an incredibly important food source for larval cod. 
So where the phytoplankton are is where the zooplankton are, where the zooplankton are is most likely where these larval cod are going to have higher survival. Now this map up above shows the distribution of these copepods back in the 80s and then in more recent years. Um, so the darker colors are higher abundance, the lighter colors are lower abundance. And what you can see is that back in the 80s, um, these, these little copepods were pretty well distributed across the Gulf of Maine. They were more concentrated in the west, which is again another factor leading to higher abundance there. But you could find them right across the Gulf of Maine. So a larval cod anywhere out in the Gulf of Maine had a good chance of feeding, surviving, and eventually becoming an adult cod. In recent years, however, we've seen these, these little um, copepods get more and more concentrated in the western Gulf of Maine. And so it's perhaps not surprising, on top of these um, ocean currents, that the uh, distribution of adult cod has become more and more. Concentrated. So we're really seeing the resource contract into just one small area. So all of these effects of climate change, these temperature and, and current and plankton effects, have also not gone unnoticed in, in the press. Um, this is a selection of headlines that, that sort of followed right on the heels of the ones I showed earlier about the cuts in cod quotas and the economic impacts those were having that have to do with climate change and, and its effects on cod. So this is something people have been paying attention to. Now, interestingly, climate change may be doing something to actually help fix this problem. Um, now, this, this map here shows, back in 2012, we, as many of you might remember, had the hottest summer we've had on record. Um, it was sweltering, it was painful, and it wasn't felt just on land. In fact, it was perhaps felt more strongly in the ocean. Um, this map shows the deviation from the average, the 20-year average temperature that was felt across the Atlantic Ocean in 2012. Um, and what you can see is the most severe heat was actually in our part of the world, in the Gulf of Maine, and, and actually across a lot of this um, distribution of cod in the Northwest Atlantic. And this was, you know, this was part of a, of a long-term warming trend the figure on the bottom shows, but it took a jump that year. So we had a really, really hot summer for, again, for cold water fish. Now why I say that might be helping us was because what we saw happen that year, um, actually this time graph shows what the movie would have shown, is by the time we reached the mid to late, um, about the 2007-2011 period, that's the distribution of codfish across the Gulf of Maine. And you can see what I was describing earlier, how they're really packed into this western area. In 2012, during that heat wave, we saw something we hadn't seen for a long time. It's, there's not a pointer, is there, Brian? No, that's all right. Um, you can see this big sort of grayish bulge sticking, coming off the coast of Maine that you don't see in the top graph. What we saw happening that year was these cod that have really become concentrated in the western Gulf of Maine the waters were getting so hot, they were starting to swim north, and they were starting to swim east into deeper water and colder water to try to escape that heat. Um, the reason I say it's a good thing is because these areas that have been devoid of cod for a long time, and we've wondered, how can we get them back there? Will we ever get them back there? Are we going to be dealing with a resource that's really stuck in this little pocket? Well, nature began to correct the problem for us. Well, I guess we began to correct the problem for us by pumping a lot of CO2 in. Here. But anyway, um, those warming waters are, are, are seeming to cause a redistribution of codfish, which may not be a bad thing for the future of that population, um, because as I've said, there's some real dangers of them all being compacted into one area. On top of that, um, to go back to these river herring, um, Along the coast of Maine, there's been some really important efforts underway to restore river herring in some of the biggest rivers in Maine. Uh, you may have heard about the Penobscot River, where they've taken down um, a hydroelectric dam, the first time, I believe, in our nation's history, where the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission did not renew a hydro license and said a dam had to be taken down. That was a huge step. Um, the map I'm showing here is actually the St. Croix River, which forms the border between Maine and New Brunswick. Um, this river, it's estimated, could support the largest population of herring on the East Coast, but for the fact that the state of Maine in the mid-1990s voted to close all of its fish ladders. 
The reason they decided to do that was because there were conflicts between fishermen chasing freshwater bass, which were a non-native species, who felt that these river herring were having adverse effects on the bass. Now, there's no scientific evidence of that, but they had the right political connections and they won the day. A 20 plus year effort as of last year finally reversed that decision. So this map actually shows the um, population of herring in um, the St. Croix River. And you can see back in the 80s, the fish ladders weren't working very well. So they actually invested some money, fixed the fish ladders, um, and the population started to climb. But then starting in the early 1990s, they started making these decisions to close the fish ladders and it came crashing right down. Um, and it's sort of been barely hanging on in the um, in the downstream reaches of the river for 20 plus years. And we've now just made a decision to open this river back up and let this population grow. So these cod that are now moving back north again, um, trying to escape this heat, may, thanks to these restoration efforts, um, find that they have a good food source. And it may, it may compel them to stay rather than turning around and swimming right back our way if things cool down. So, this gives me some hope um, that we may be able to reestablish populations in this area, which I think will benefit the entire Gulf of Maine. Um, on top of that, and this I'm not going to talk too much about because this I think is something John's going to talk about, but in the western Gulf of Maine, these two red areas here are um, fishery closed areas or marine protected areas, fishery refuges that have been created in the late 90s and early 2000s. And They've actually done a pretty good job of protecting habitats and, and, and giving these fish a refuge from fishing mortality. But you can see they're, they're pretty shifted over to the west. Um, but what the, some of the fishery managers are considering right now is creation of three new closed areas um, in the eastern Gulf of Maine, an area that's been devoid of these refuges for the last few decades. So as these fish move north with these warming waters, they may find themselves in a place where there's more prey species available as these herring populations recover. The habitat is well protected within these, um, within these closures, and they have a refuge from fishing mortality. So this is why I think we may be seeing the right alignment of conditions to actually start to help cod turn the corner. Um, it remains to be seen, but I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't have some optimism. Along the way, there's one other thing I think that can, that can help cod fish. Um, these are, these are graphs of the population trend for four other species of ground fish, or four other species of these bottom-dwelling predators that are caught along with cod in this multi-species fishery. The Acadian red fish, uh, Georgia's bank haddock, the Atlantic pollock, and silver hake. These are four species that are actually doing fairly well. Um, and, and that's what these plots all show, is that their populations are all relatively stable, like hake. Um, you know, Georgia's bank haddock has had a massive upswing. Redfish has had a nice climb. Um, Pollock is right about where he wanted to be. That's the, the dashed line is the target population, and it's right there. So while there's a lot of, of pessimism and, and sort of doom and gloom stories about cod that are not completely unjustified, there are some success stories out there. The problem is, with maybe with the exception of haddock, I'm betting most of you have never heard of, and those of you who eat fish have probably not tried most, if not all, of these fish. Um, one thing a lot of groups are trying to do, industry groups, environmental groups, governments, is to, um, universities even, are trying to direct people toward these, what we call underutilized species. So healthy resources, but that just don't quite have the market demand that things like cod and flounder do. And, the reason I bring these up is because I think if we can increase the markets for these species, we can take pressure off cod, we can offset some of the economic losses fishermen are suffering due to cuts in cod quotas, and maybe help the fleet bridge the gap between where we are now and a recovered cod resource. Now, when I made this point in other talks, one question I often get is, well, wait a minute, do we now want to overfish all these species? And, and, and of course we don't. Um, but we've made some, I think, really important changes to our fishery management system recently. We now have requirements for hard catch limits, um, and not just catch limits, but very risk-averse catch limits. So we, we put in buffers against uncertainties in the science to guard against overfishing. In addition, we've created a management system that better aligns economic incentives with biological goals. 
that hadn't been the case before. So I'm confident now that if we have resources that are healthy, fished under this new system, they'll stay healthy. And so by starting to get fishermen to target these fish, get a higher price for them, I think we can ease back on cod and allow them to recover. That's my hope anyway. Oops. Um, so to sum all that up, um, cod are suffering, there's no doubt about it. And they're suffering due to some combination of overfishing, um, climate change, again, there's been a lot of attention in the news about climate change. I'm gonna be very clear about this, it doesn't let overfishing off the hook. We have fished these things too hard for too long and we're starting to back off, but it's gonna take time for that to have an effect. Uh, one important point I wanna make here, when I talk about overfishing, Many people think that is, you know, sort of implicitly blaming fishermen. In my view, fishing is not the cause of overfishing. Overfishing is a policy problem. It's a political problem, it's often an economic problem. But when a fisherman unties his boat, heads out to sea, if he follows the rules and that leads to overfishing, he's not to blame. It might even be a scientific problem. In fact, in many cases it is. If our science is overly optimistic and we're not honest enough about the uncertainty. So, Overfishing, which has all these real root problems, has definitely been um, a cause of the state we're in. In addition, all these effects of climate change I've talked about, depletion of key prey species, and, and other factors as well. I don't have time to go into all of them. But I think cod could come back, and I think it could come back to, to um, reducing fishing pressure and better aligning economic incentives with biological goals recovery of some of these key prey species, especially river herring, creation of these refuges that, again, I think John's going to talk more about, and more diversified sea mar seafood markets that takes the pressure off cod and directs it towards some of these healthier stocks. So with that said, I'll say thank you. I don't know if you want to take questions now or uh, later. During the panel. There? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Concerning the NPAs potentially going up in the uh, eastern Gulf of Maine, I'm wondering um, if there's anything holding that back, or are you relatively optimistic about those getting set up soon? And also, are we using habitat uh, management to actually determine where to put those? Sure. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about the ones in the eastern Gulf of Maine. Uh, there's a lot of resistance among fishermen to MPAs, although one thing that's been interesting since some of my colleagues and I have started talking to fishermen about this is there's actually more support than I thought um, and, and some, some really nuanced views. Um, and I think the, those who are really anti-MPA have been the most vocal, um, but as some of the fishermen who have seen value in them start to see them under threat, they're starting to speak up as well. So that gives me optimism. Frankly, the other thing that gives me optimism about the potential for MPAs in the Eastern Gulf of Maine, as I said, is there's not, not a lot of ground fish out there right now. Um, most of the fishing in that area is lobster, far and away, and these really wouldn't affect the lobster fishery. So um, there, there seems to be, you know, with the, the council can be a fickle beast sometimes. Um, <coughs> But there does seem to be reasonable interest in doing something in that area because it's so devoid of fish, you know, we need to try something different. And I forget the second part of your question. Uh, are we using habitat modeling to set this up? Yeah, John. Uh, is it in state waters? No, it's all out of state waters. But the, the map you showed, um, I, that area right out of Penobscot Bay lit up as one of the yeah as one of the habitat. But I'm not certain if that's um, being selected in part because of it being uh, good habitat for juvenile fish, or spawning fish historically. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the way, the way they're, what John talked about was the first step in this process to propose new MPAs, which was this very detailed, complicated, seven-year habitat um, analysis. It was all about vulnerability. But, but, Getting to the stage of actually developing proposed areas, um, the council and its technical teams have started to add in other information. So it's not strictly the results of the analysis that John talked about that is popping out new areas. We're starting to look not just at the habitat, but at the fish themselves and saying, you know, and John alluded to this, where are there spawning aggregations? Where are we seeing particularly old fish, which are disproportionately important for reproduction? 
Um, there's been some discussion of where we're seeing severely depleted species, species that you know, someday may be candidates for endangered species listing if we don't get proactive about it. So there's a lot of factors being considered, um, and socioeconomic factors as well. You know, trying, if you have two areas that are reasonably ecologically equivalent, but one is more important to fishermen, well, you might leave that open and get the same ecological value from another. So it's getting to be a more complicated um, evaluation at this stage. And I would say, like, it did, I remember it lighting up, but I don't, I don't think we had recommended it that, but I do believe they would have reviewed that information and used that as part of it. The other thing I'd say is that um, the Down East Initiative in that part of uh, the Eastern Gulf of Maine has been, very, you know, has been very aggressive about implementing a local management. And so part of that has been the willingness, I think, to adapt, you know, adopt things like closed areas and, you know, more um, aggressive spatial management. She has a follow-up. I, I think I know the answer to this, but one of the, the designs that's tried on the West Coast is, is flexible MPA locations, where depending on environmental conditions, especially with climate change, you move them around or you expand them or contract them. Is there any possibility of that? Or if I understood you, you said it took seven years just to get some of these in place. Is there any chance of that kind of management approach? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the seven-year thing gets a little overstated because yeah. what John and the group he was working with did was you know, when we do a stock assessment, we have models we take off the shelf and plug data into them. When it comes to a habitat evaluation, we don't have those tools. So these guys built a model from the ground up. I mean, it's a really impressive piece of work, and it's something that I think, you know, New England is often seen as kind of the ugly stepchild of fisheries in the U.S. You know, everything's going wrong, and we're dysfunctional, and it's a nightmare. And, you know, I push back against that a lot, and I could go into a long rant about that that I'll, I'll skip. Um, but I do think this, well, um, but, but I do think actually this, this habitat analysis that John's been part of is something that's really novel, really cutting edge, and we should promote uh, as part of New England being really innovative. So the length of time it's taken is due in part to the fact that we had to build a new tool. Um, still, you know, the regulatory process is not quick. Um, there's a lot of layer opportunities for public comment, there's review periods, and, um, and you know, I, I, I'd like to see more of that flexibility. I, I think the fact that we are talking about closures in that eastern main area is also partly motivated by climate change, looking ahead to how the ecosystem might be evolving um, and trying to get ahead of the curve in terms of where species are going. Yeah, and I'd say like the, the tool was built in about two years, but there was always a recognition that it, it doesn't tell you everything you need to know. It really just right. focuses on the vulnerability side of but yeah. it's one of those weird yeah. things where the science actually moved faster than policy. Current <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no national borders, what kind of collaboration or uh, conflict is going on between you know, East Maine and Canada? Well, in the Gulf of Maine, not much. Um, again, because most of the cod in the Gulf of Maine are, are in the West. Georgia's Bank is a different story. Um, Georgia's Bank, the Hague Line, which is the ocean boundary between the US and Canada, basically chops off about the far third of um, Georgia's Bank and, and says it's Canadian waters. There's something called the TRAC, which stands for Transboundary Resource Assessment Committee. And then a separate, that's, that's sort of a, a joint scientific process between the two countries to jointly manage, to uh, assess Georgia Bank COD. Then there's something, I forget the other initialism, but a parallel management system that allocates the resource. It, it works reasonably well, but it's completely voluntary on, this, on both nations' side. There's no formal treaty, um, and that makes it very unstable. So it's sort of an uneasy balance right now of jointly assessing and allocating as fairly as possible that resource. But conflicts do certainly arise. Safe to say there's a lot more tension around uh, lobster uh, area. Yeah. There's a zone that it's disputed uh, that who owns it, and uh, there's a called the gray zone or gray area um, that uh, has been kind of contentious for many, many uh, years. Yeah. Another species that has a similar joint management and, and assessment system is yellowtail flounder um, on the end of Georgia's Bank. 
And there's more contentious to snare because yellowtail flounder are one of the most common types of bycatch in the Georges Bank scallop fishery, which is the most valuable fishery in the nation. It, it approaches a half a billion dollars a year in revenues. Um, and a low allocation of yellowtail flounder can really constrain you know, the, the most valuable fishery in the country. So there's a lot, I'd say there's probably a lot more contentiousness about um, yellowtail than cod. Although a lot of that though has to do with what the science is telling us about the state of the resource. But the two countries are pretty much in agreement on that. It has less to do with the allocation. Okay, so you have to bear me. My question will get back to Canada. So, um, <laughs> so my, I have two questions. So the first one is, you showed at first you showed the map, the range of cod. It ranges all the way from Maine all the way up to Greenland. So is that one big population that migrates back and forth with each other, or is there like a trade-off? Because what I saw earlier was when uh, the Gulf of Maine crashed, it came around a similar time when Grand Banks population crash. So I just thought, well, is that together? And then you brought up how climate change will slowly move this range northwards. So do you guys make plans of how New England fishery is going to manage as the fish is going moving towards Canada and you guys might lose the population altogether? Or big Canada. So, <laughs> so, so the answer to the first question, um, it's not really a single population across that whole range. It's more of what we call a metapopulation, which is distinct local populations that have some degree of connection by either movement of adults or dispersal of larvae. So it's sort of almost like a stepping stone um, of connections across the North Atlantic. So but if you look at Maine on one end and Russia on the extreme other end, probably very different genetically and de demographically. But if you look at Maine relative to, say, the Scotian Shelf, the Scotian Shelf relative to the Grand Banks, the Grand Banks relative to Greenland, and so on, you have a, a steady chain. Um, there's actually been some interesting work that's shown that over fairly large scales, because of those connections, it used to be that cod populations, as you alluded to, went up and down together. But as too many of them came down, what we're starting to see is those connections have been broken. And so now they're not ebbing and flowing in synchrony they're behaving in a more isolated way. And, that, and that's a real cause for concern. Um, and the second part of your question was about climate change and range movement. And that's a really timely question, because the council actually, every year the council, at the end of the year, votes on what they're going to prioritize. You know, there's a thousand issues the council could deal with for a whole bunch of different fisheries. They prioritize you know, a manageable number of issues that they're really going to dig into. And this year, for the first time, they've been talking about it for a while, but they prioritized ecosystem-based management, um, largely in response to these climate effects. And it's not clear exactly what decisions and strategies they'll come up with. Um, one thing that's been interesting to see is a lot of fishermen are reporting that while cod and other typical species in the Gulf of Maine are pushing north, we're starting to see mid-Atlantic species make appearances in the Gulf of Maine. So, Fishermen in Port Clyde, Maine, last year for the first time that I know of, geared up to catch squid in commercially viable quantities. Um, you know, not commercially viable yet, but fishermen are starting to see black sea bass come up in their nets. Uh, Atlantic croaker. These are species that have always been rare to not exist in the Gulf of Maine that are starting to give a hint that they may be establishing populations which could offset the losses of some of the traditional yeah, you know, that's that's definitely going to create a lot of challenges for the council and by virtue of that for us on this. This is kind of a very broad and general question. You mentioned a number of different variables, and I apologize if I miss one or if it's not classified as a variable. I would say that you know, fishermen is a variable, climate change is a variable, ocean currents are a variable, policy is a variable. Um, and again, there may be some other variables, but what would you say is the most important, and I, and I guess the ability to gather good data is a variable. What would you say is the most important, say, two things, and, and, and um, how would you propose to control those? You can't control climate, 
control fishermen. You know, what what are the two most important variables that you think uh, lead to a solution in terms of how to rebound some of these species? That is a great great question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, in my in my mind, the two things that I would want is one is that you know we're getting good quantitative data. You know, so we know how temperatures changing, how that's driving changes in potential populations. And the second is that we have adaptive policies in place that can respond to those, whether it's closed areas that move, you know, and create, you know, if we know the fish are going to move as a function of temperature, we don't want to have a static closed area. Conversely, if we're, if we're really just going to play the numbers game, we, we need to be able to adapt to a shrinking population in one region. Because we know there's critical thresholds, you know, where we're going to get into heavily overfished species to the point that they're probably not going to be able to, to rebuild as quickly. So I think that good data and good adaptive uh, policy that's hopefully very directed. You know, we're not managing days at sea. We're managing the, the amount of fish that are being landed. You know. What did you say? <laughs> Can you, uh, said that you would not feel guilty about eating cod. Could you elaborate on that comment? <laughs> <laughs> Could I say that? You did. I did say that. Well, so, well, essentially what I mean is that, uh, you know, there's, they've, this industry has faced very heavy cutbacks. And with that 61 to 77 percent reduction, depending on whether you're talking about Georgia's bank or the Gulf of Maine, those cutbacks are built into the models so that, they, you know, there are cutbacks that have been mandated to put those uh, population or those stocks on a rebuilding trajectory. So we, my, so what we're landing should be sustainable. You know, it should, we should be moving towards a, you know, a, a healthier cod population, recognizing those huge cutbacks. So my, my sense is that one thing I said is that so say you say, okay, cod are really bad. I, mean, I would not want to eat cod if I thought there was a lot of cheating occurring or, you know, for some reason, you know, we're not meeting those targets. But we haven't landed above the, the quota and, and or above the tack, the allowable catch in some time, right? right? Yeah, so, I mean, we've set, the, we've set the policies in place. Essentially what I'm saying is that, you know, if we're imposing this management structure and you believe in it, then we should go out and, you know, Put our money where our mouth is. Uh, I have a point that relates to the previous questions. I'm a researcher in uh, Bergen, Norway, on fisheries science, and we have in Norway the Northeast Arctic cod, which is the largest population of cod in the world. To give you a perspective, uh, this year's quota was 1 million tons, which is 2.2 .2 billion pounds for a quota, which means the population is way above that. Uh, and that's why you can eat cod, because there is a lot of it. So we uh, consumers need to be really careful about what population they're talking about, because it's not just on a species basis. But just to elaborate on that, why is the cod in Norway so big? And uh, the Norwegian, the, this is the Northeast Arctic cod, so it's also uh, consumers will recognize it as Icelandic cod or Norwegian cod. In the 80s, it made a big dip, and it was pretty low. But this coincided with the oil production at sea, and that Norwegian fishermen could come out of the fishery and into a new sector to get jobs. And that reduced the effort. And the reduction of effort, as John said, is that's that's the name of the game. That's if you want to save fish, you have to reduce effort. And all these other biological things, habitat protection, obviously that's important. But at the end of the, if you want to talk about ecosystem-based management, humans or fish, they're the top predators. And if you can control that, um, this is very important. And I just want to put a plug in also for the importance of social and economic assessments in fisheries, because we are talking about uh, effort as being an important thing. And the cod recovered because of this effort reduction in Norway in the 80s and 90s. And in 2004, we're talking about US and Canada working together for management. In 2004, Norway and Russia put together a harvest control rule for the cod. And we've done an analysis that shows that the harvest control rule puts the cod at a, very, at a bioeconomic maximum, actually, on the 10 to 10 to 10 to 
so you have the dual nation um, cooperation, political cooperation to have illegal fisheries at a, a bare minimum. You have the uh, ability for fishermen, if they want to get out of the fishery, they can get into other jobs. Um, and I think that the Northeast Arctic Cod is a, is a real good example to look at and how we can work together with nations and work to reduce effort and have a very healthy population. Can I just add something onto what John said? Though I, I agree with John completely. Um, you know, my organization is one of many that is involved in sort of scoring, ranking, certifying seafood as being sustainable. And I, and I think within that sort of movement, there's been a real evolution since it began. Um, originally, the focus was very much on the status of the resource. And I, and I think that's what's kind of motivating your question. If cod are doing so bad, how in, you know, how in good conscience can you eat them? Well, because, you know, we see these problems with many fisheries, um, organizations like mine and others try to come up with new management strategies to do better, to help the resource turn around, to align incentives, and we then go and ask fishermen to buy into that. And we ask them to make some pretty big changes, and these are guys who don't like to change the way they do things, they're pretty set in their ways. Um, um, because they're good at what they do, and, and they learn to work within a system, they get good at it, and then you come along and say, well, we'd actually like you to do it differently. When they do buy into it and support it, you know, I feel there's an obligation to reward them for it. And if, and if we believe in the management systems that we've proposed and implemented, then as John said, they should have us on the right track. And I don't think it's fair to say to the fishermen, okay, thank you for making this huge change to the way you do things, now in 10 years when this stock you know, quadruples in size, then we'll start telling consumers they can eat your product. Um, you know, we, we went from a quota of around 7,000 metric tons to one of 1,500 metric tons. And so, um, and, and I'm talking here about New England cod. I mean, yeah, Norwegian cod is really abundant and well-managed. You see a piece of Norwegian cod, if you're okay with the carbon emissions it took to get it here, then, then go for it. Um, but when it comes to New England cod, I agree with John, you know, the resource is low, but the quota has responded. The management system is is tougher and more ambitious now, and the product that comes to port, in my view, is managed in a way that's giving the resource a chance to recover. And and buying cod and doing so and encouraging others um, is helping fishermen get through this tough time. I think the real challenge is going to be if you know we impose these dramatic cuts and environmental forcing. You know, continues to push cod out of the Gulf of Maine um, over the next 20 years. That's a really tough scenario where we've managed for you know rebuilding a stock that's not going to rebuild, and it's of no fault to, of the fisheries. The only hope there, I think, is that resources that come into the Gulf of Maine, like black sea bass and you know squid, replace the fishery. But I mean. That's a, that's a big um, change. You know, we're we're struggling, I think, now to get management uh, in place. You know, striped bass simply aren't managed north of Cape Cod. Uh, you know, so and people are catching them at pretty high rates. Um, and you know, we don't have a good uh, plan for that. So, see, last question, please. Um, I have a long and kind of broad question for you. <laughs> uh, Firstly, I'm, I'm not sure if I ever had cod in my life or not. And uh, secondly, I'm an architect. So uh, I'm not really related to fish in any way. I'm just uh, interested, but how can I uh, involve in this uh, issue? And now, currently, I'm studying master of design for sustainable urban environment. And I'm doing a research on um, how wind turbines can uh, help the energy consuming in cities. So a good place for wind turbines uh, in uh, an offshore is about 30 or 50 miles uh, away the coastline. I wonder if it, it uh, has a kind of effect on uh, cost in, in a way or not. Uh, or have you ever thought about this? I'm pretty sure that the wind combine will be the 
mean, there's there's the potential for it um, to disrupt where people fish for sure. Uh, my understanding is that um, uh, insurance companies will not allow fishing vessels, commercial fishing vessels, to pass within some distance of uh, any kind of hard structure that's been set up like that, like a, a windmill, or and I would imagine the same would be uh, true for a wind turbine, given the um, economic risk that would be associated with striking it, sinking a boat, or causing damage to a structure. Um, there's the potential that the structure that the turbines provide might be good habitat, and might also, um, uh, you know, potentially damage fish. There's all kinds of what ifs. Uh, but I think uh, there's a lot of ongoing research in the Gulf of Maine. I know the University of Maine has put a lot of effort towards studying uh, benthic impacts all the way up to the um, to, to, you know, waterfowl and what are the impacts going to be. Um, I mean, hopefully, and so I think there's the other aspect, the last thing I'll mention is that it's one of these things that's very similar to the, you know, the kind of developed versus developing world issues where we ask the developing world to make sacrifices you know, their practices, uh, so that to help the environment, or to help, there should be some economic incentives to do that, right? So if you're gonna displace somebody on a local level um, if, to help the environment, hopefully, you know, we can offset those costs. So that it's a win-win. Yeah. 